you got three types of people in the world. You got cutters, you got burners, you got pickers. I'm a cutter. I used to cut myself, and you know, it it used used to make me feel better. And my basement was all white, so when I would cut myself, I would write write the things down in in my own blood that bothered me. So when you turn the red lights on and 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 you shut the regular lights off, all that red blood turns black. pick up the phone and the guy says yeah is this Mike and I'm like yeah who's this and he goes this is Jerry only from the Misfits I almost fell off my bed chilly I saw that firsthand and I was like so inspired you know I mean there's Jerry only calling me as soon as the show started ba boom I got all dressed up and, you know, I did my hair so I looked like a misfit. And, yeah, I made sure I looked really cool, you know? The kid comes trucking full speed right towards the equipment. So I step out front and right as he's coming at me, I just grab him in a chokehold and start dragging him towards the front of the stage. In our initial phone conversation, I expressed to him that I was very interested in what he was doing. And, and let's face it, I was. So I drag him to the front of the stage, look down at security, they're looking up at me, we make icon like, like, hey, I got this guy, he's coming down. I throw him off the stage from seven feet up in the air, and security just lets him go, head first into the concrete. I thought I killed the guy. You know, Jerry was there at the time, I met Jerry, and I was really intrigued by him, and this was a hero to me, you know, and, uh, Things would change in the future, but for now, that's what happened. Now, if you can imagine 4,000 already worked up Chileans all booing in unison. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. The creative process, which I think is unconscious, just, uh, revolves around a lot of uneasiness, you know, in the inside. Their job is to report, you know, on, you know, the state of the world, humanity, and uh, where people are. And being successful or even just functional as an artist is another big problem. Uh, the artistic life and the creative life uh, is is a different way of approaching life and it has a different value system when it comes to assessing your success or failure. I don't think you're ever satisfied with anything, even myself. You know, I, like, for instance, I could record a song and you might say, wow, that's fantastic. You know, but I could pick out every flaw. You know, I feel like what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not going to sell a billion books, you know? So what? <laughs> you know? So what? Um, I, I write, you know, I do what I want to do, and, I, and I'm, I'm comfortable. Life can be beautiful, but it also has its, its, um, its tragedies and sorrows and pain. Art is something that should express all those things. We were discussing uh, victimization and why some people succeed as being artists and other people don't make it and I think that has a lot to do with their own psychology. I think I was very lucky. I had, uh, I had music, rock and roll in particular, as my guiding light. Uh, I think there should be importance to what you write about uh, so that you don't just write about silly things. Uh, so what influences me, I think life in general, personal happenings, um, anything that means something to me, I write and give the, the chance for the, the reader or the listener to interpret, interpret it into his, home, his or her own style or, or interpretation, whatever it may be. Uh, so I don't think it necessarily has to be uh, you know, focused on one subject. It could be anything. I just wanted to make an album for myself. 
when I made that conscious decision to actually write music for myself, it had nothing to do with really even taking it to a level of a touring band or making other albums or playing out. And I just had this idea to write 12 songs and I was gonna put out an album. Mike was our local Marilyn Manson when I was a kid. I was 16 or 17 when I came into the scene and Mike was our local rock star. Mike, like, Mike was what you shot to be. He was the real deal. Mike is rock and roll. He, his, his whole life is pretty much the rock and roll life. Mike used to work here uh, when this was two-tone, and I knew him before that, you know, just in the scene. I remember Mike is being the guy um, at two-tone that yeah. always told me Doc Martens. He was always like, well, like, um, eccentric guy. Like, you'd be like, let's go to two-tone and see, like, the crazy guy. Yeah. And Mike and Mike can tell you all kinds of crazy stories. Yeah. I've, I've played shows with him, and, and, I've, and I knew him as this character, obviously the character that we all see on stage. And then I saw him off stage and he was still that character. Yeah, Mike, he's this scary prince of darkness, you know, and then you, you talk to the guy and you realize he's a complete buffoon and doofus. And, which I love because I'm a buffoon and a doofus too and we talk, you know, quoting The Simpsons and shit like that. Mike certainly stuck it out from an early age. He's got the, the you know, the little aura around him like a rock star should, you know? I mean, you know, people go, oh, who's that, you know? So there's just something with some people, they just either got the look or there's just something about it that they walk into the room, you know, people, are, you know, take a little bit of a notice to it and Mikey's definitely got it. He, he, you know, he's got a bit of an ego and I think um, maybe if he would have kept that in check and, 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 you know, maybe he could have gone a little further. Mike was, he's not just a performer, but he was living this life. He had this, this really alternative view of reality, a very alternative lifestyle. I admired that. When you're constantly looking at that and, and, and are exposed to that, I think that it puts you in touch with your mortality. Well, you know what they always say to me? I can't believe that you smile so much and laugh because you're a god. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I should just walk around all day and not talk to anybody and be miserable. That's really what they think um, somebody like me is like. There's always been something symbolic about donning a mask um, in all, a lot of cultures. The mask is like a ritual. You uh, assume the identity of uh, the uh, creature or uh, the person that you're uh, becoming. I've seen riots. I've, I've seen, seen a guy get his, his face ripped off in Detroit. I saw a guy hit by a car in, in Denver and, and cream dead. The horror is out there. And the masses, the norm, you know, maybe need to wake up a little bit, get, get that, that shake to, to have that little twinge of fear that, hey, this could come knocking on my door. Maybe I should prepare for this. It's, it's made me more aware of my mortality and how precious that is. You know, it didn't matter, like, you know, how you looked or anything, you know, it was just a matter of, you know, whether you wrote a good song or not. It's not like we had to dress the part, you know, it's not like, oh, today we're gonna put on our makeup and play the part. It's what it was. We knew at the time we were a part of something that was different and special, but I guess we didn't really know that, you know, all this time later, it would become like a legendary thing. There was the scene of the bands, especially in New Jersey, the groups that were doing covers, you know, Led Zeppelin covering all these bands and playing clubs to a lot of people, or a decent amount of people. Then there was the bands, the underground bands doing the originals. So it was, it was always two scenes going on. It was pretty cool and it was different at the time. What do we sound like? Uh, we sound like Black Sabbath meets meets the Beatles rehearsing drunk on a haunted factory. You know, you had the Ramones and the Dead Boys and Blondie and Talking Heads and, you know, all of these bands and they all sounded different. But they were all like, you know, like what you would call, I guess, punk bands. I mean, basically just rock and roll bands. But the music had substance at that point. You know, the cherry thought. pie, I mean, you know, <laughs> suck my dick. <laughs> the Fields of Nephilim, Christian Death, all those bands are right. like at that same level, well, which, which is above like the local band level. Okay. And also, I gotta mention the, the, the whole club thing that was going on at the bank, and you know, we go to Aldo's, and it was a great time, it was a lot of fun.
It was 4th of July, 1979, the night that, like, I decided to, like, really party hard. And I took, I took, like, one and a half quaaludes, drank a couple of beers. Then a friend of mine comes to me and says, ever have, an, ever have a Long Island iced tea? And I'm like, no. He's like, oh, you got to have one of those. So I collapsed and went into convulsions in the middle of the floor. And uh, Glenn's girlfriend was, was like the co-manager at the Mud Club at the time. She saw me. She came over. She grabbed me. She kind of like slapped me a little bit, like brought me to a little, said, we got to find you a place to sit. The only table that was, the only seat that was empty was in this booth that John Lennon was sitting in. So she sits me down, and I didn't even know who it was that, yet, because I was like just like so obliterated. She sits me down. All I remember was her saying, "I'll be right back. Don't do anything." And next thing I next thing I remember was all these girls just like throwing drinks on me and yelling at me and cursing at me and saying, "Why did you do that?" And I said, "What did I do?" And they said, "You threw up on John Lennon." <laughs> Beginning it was just punk, and I don't think they even. Well, they're kind of like the damned. The damned were just happened to be there at the right place at the right time. They weren't trying to be punk, they were punks. The first time I heard 20 Eyes, like, I didn't know if I liked it or not. I was like, this is weird, like, because like, I was in that punk mindset. I was like, is this, is this punk rock? Is this cool? I was uh, a big Misfits fan. As a matter of fact, the first time I've ever played on stage, um, we did a cover of The Devil's Whorehouse. Any band doing anything remotely horror or horror punk or horror rock or spook rock or whatever you want to call it, Certainly is is drawing influence from the Misfits, yes. Everybody plays a Misfits cover song if you're in a band from New Jersey. You know, and, and you know, it's just it's just a, it's a staple. Every fucking band we ever play with covers a goddamn Misfits song. I mean, god damn it, that's annoying. You know? I mean I, no, I love the Misfits, don't get me wrong. I mean, yeah, I was listening to a lot of Misfits before like Wild well, Bloody Kisses was being written and uh, exposed Peter to a lot of it. And, I think it, it did definitely have a creative impact on like songs like Black Number One. That band was so dark and so brooding and so heavy and so charismatic, and that was the beauty of them. Glenn definitely had some insight about what was going on in the whole New York scene. Um, you know, you know, he 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 knew you know what we should be doing to kind of climb the ladder, so to speak. It's a shame we all didn't stay together for the four original members from back, you know, in the late 70s. That sound, that that energy, that they were, that was going on inside of a fucking garage. It was just permeating all over the place. It was like, fuck, I need to do this. Steve happened to live on that side of Lodi where Jerry, where we were rehearsing, and he was like, you know, a few doors away. I always used to look forward to their rehearsals. You know, whether it was inside or whether I was sitting, there was like uh, apartments that I lived in and they had these uh, garages right next door to them. So I'd sit on the roof of the garage and just listen to them. And those were the real misfits. That was the, that, that was it. We all graduate together, class of 82. So it was me, it was Doyle, uh, you know, Paul, uh, Eric Stellman, uh, it was Airy Vaughn. And My brothers are Jerry and Doyle from the Misfits. I grew up with them in Lodi, New Jersey. Lodi was a pretty cool town. There were a lot of, lot, lot of, lot of, lot of people having a lot of different bands, of which most of them were doing covers. Uh, most of those people that were following those bands or friends of those bands looked at us like we were the outcasts because we're doing originals. We're never going to get nowhere, et cetera, and so on. Well, it didn't seem like it was too, too out of the ordinary anyway. I mean, uh, I guess later on we figured out it was when you know we realized we had a lot more musicians around and. Most other schools did. So that lineup was Glenn, Jerry, Manny, and myself. Shortly thereafter, Manny was replaced by Mr. Jim. You know, they gave me a call. They said, you, you want to do it? I said, sure. That's when they started developing a look and a sound that was a little bit unique. A little bit unique. Glenn is a little closer to my age, so we liked a lot of the same music. Um, Glenn also knew a lot about rockabilly and stuff like that. I think we all played our role uh, at the time. Um, you know, Jerry was the bass player, you know, at the time with the blue hair, so he was kind of defining himself for who he was. That single look with the, the devil locks and everything, that came after I was gone. Glenn, I would say, was the leader of the band as far as, you know, he wrote the material. We, but we all worked on it together and had some input on the songs, et cetera, and so on. I think Jerry was, uh, he was good to the people. The people liked what they saw in him. When I say Glenn was the leader, he was the most influential. 
uh, we were all pretty friendly and all did our own thing. But obviously, yes, Jerry and Glenn were the, you know, only two consistent members from the beginning to the end. So they may have had a little bit of a bond there, I would say. You know, then you have Bobby joins and, and there's Halloween, We Are 138, and like the really fucking songs that, that just crank and rock and sizzle, you know? The Misfits, okay, were like the most violent, like, bad group that ever came out of New York City, if not anywhere else in the world. Okay, Gigi Allen would have run screaming for a Misfits show. By Bobby being in the band, um, it brought more people in, because people already kind of knew who he was. Um, yeah, it got, it started getting, the show started getting like, like crazy. Okay, there'd be ambulances parked outside Max's Kansas City if they knew the Misfits were going to be playing. Of course, they knew there was going to be like, bloodbath. Girls are running out of the crowd, holding their noses and they're bleeding and, <laughs> you know, all, all that kind of early punk rock type stuff. It was, it was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I wound up in jail. People wound up in the emergency rooms, you know? And I was, that was, that wasn't rare, you know? That was like, that was uh, the whole phenomenon of the Misfits was that the crowd would get stirred up so much that all hell would break loose. Um, I was always nervous that somebody was going to get seriously hurt, and uh, thankfully, well, later on when Doyle got in the band, that's when people started getting seriously hurt. Doyle was a bit younger than us, you know. So I mean, you know, you know, now there's not a big difference in age, but I mean, back then, you know, when when you're 19, 20, and he's 12 or 13 or 11, whatever he was, it's a little bit of a difference. But he was there. Always, you know, hanging around, watching us rehearse when we were rehearsing, because we used to rehearse at times, you know, by Jerry's house. So he was there, you know, and, you know, he, he learned, I think, to play the guitar from us. If Doyle had been a drummer, Googie would have been the one that got screwed. You know, that was, you know, that's what it, come, that's what it came down to. It was all just like power play by Jerry. Like, they, they were afraid to tell Bobby, or they didn't want, they, they didn't know how to handle it. Or they, they just didn't come out like a man and say, hey, we're replacing you with Doyle. Bobby shows up. At the show, he goes up to the dressing room, and they tell him, oh, you're not playing tonight, Doyle's playing. He would pick up, like, Flipside magazine, so it's like, Bobby Steele did this, Bobby Steele did that, Bobby Steele threw up on John Lennon, Bobby Steele slashed a fan at a shell, you know what I mean? So it was kind of like, you know, all this shit was happening with me, and it wasn't, like, anything intentional, but, like, you know, I think Jerry was, like, really getting jealous. I have Frank Zappa here. He came to see me play. And now I'm not, I'm not even playing. That's fucked up, man. And Frank Zappa's standing, Bobby, Frank Zappa, and me. I'm like, I, I was, I was, I didn't know what to say. I was so embarrassed. Bobby, I'm sorry. It wasn't me. From what I see, when I was playing, bands were a dime a dozen. Today, they're a penny a dozen. When we were playing, you had, I think, a little bit more opportunity. Today, you need to go out there, you need to play, you need to have a following. When you have a following, it's more about the following and the money than sometimes the music. Because if you have a following and people are going to see you, then the record company is going to look at you. If you're going out there and you could have the best music in the world, and if you're playing three nights a week in front of five people, you better change your avenue and what you do. You better change your thoughts on what you're doing because then there's nothing to look at. You could have the best music out there. But if you don't have people going to see it, they're not going to be interested. I think a lot of musicians are unprepared and not in the know when they think that everything is an overnight success. Um, I think that, uh, you know, everything takes time. You know, the funny thing is, it could sit there and criticize me left and right. But the fact of the matter is, I was still playing out. And whether they came or not, I was still getting, I was generating an audience slowly but surely. The more I played out, the more exposure I got, the more different type of people I got. You have to play that show in front of five people just as well as you're playing that show in front of 500 people. Because those five people, if you suck, will tell 25 people, 30 people about the awful band they saw last night. And if you're spot on, balls out, they might tell five people about this great show and they're going to come yeah, to your next show. The more, chances the, the, the more you suck, the more likely they are to tell 
everybody. Well, not what band to go do you know about them to, to avoid? Are the ones that suck because everybody's told you not to see them, right. and you don't even know what they sound like because everybody's already told you not to see them. You know, you're ne you're never happy with yourself because every time like you record a song, you're like, well, I could have did this better, I could do this better. So, it's like, and I think if you became satisfied with yourself. On a, you know, a musical level, I think you might uh, stop your, your own growth. You know, manager was like, Motley Crue asked you to go out. You were like, what are you, crazy? How is this going to work? How is this going to work? No way, no way. He says, do it, do it, do it. It'll be good for you guys. You guys should definitely do it. And, and that's it. Reluctantly, that's we did, and that's, that's what put us on the map. Yeah, we went from selling 50 albums a week to selling 2,000 albums a week, I'm like, in one week. When I had found out that uh, the Bloody Kisses went, went, went gold, I'm like, this is like a nation of deaf people. I'm like I didn't I didn't take the band seriously. I mean, we would mock, we would call ourselves assholes before you did because, but we really meant it. And I would come in and say, just I can't believe you fucking jerk offs are actually paying to 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 fucking see this. They were working on the Motley Crue record, yeah. and then like you know while they were hanging out, whatever they were, they had a copy of Bloody Kisses and liked it. Yeah, they liked. So when the time came for them to go on the road, they were like, we want this band to come out with us. And there was a few shows that I I called people up on stage. And I gave them their money back, and I threw them out. I said, you fucking asshole. And I'm calling your mother, and I would, I would call their mother up on stage. Do you know who your fucking son is right now? The kids today, I don't know. You can put out an amazing record or a film or a piece of artwork, but, you know, after a while, people want to see something else. And you got to bring it to the next level. The pipeline was the alternative underground club to be at in northern Jersey. It was a club that catered to the goth, industrial, and punk scene. The early Empire Days stuff, there was this like misfits, damned early punk sound in there and I immediately was like, I gotta, I gotta audition for bass punk, I, I gotta be in this band. I had flyered so much for three months uh, that so many people were eager to see what we had to give that we actually drew about maybe 100, 150 people, which I considered to be a pretty good, uh, a good count for a band that had never played out before. It was the first 12 inch, it was titled The Empire Hideous. I was happy when it came out at the time. I was amazed. I was like, whoa, this is, you know, my song on a record. I was amazed. I thought it was going to sell like, the first weekend, I saw. I thought I was gonna sell 300 copies, and uh, I brought the, like 10 albums. Fi no, I brought like 50 albums with me. I think I sold one. We had people being uh, rejected and coming into the pipeline at one time, and that was pretty cool. I mean, there was a lot of bands that were pretty big, that you know they packed the place, but it wasn't like they were turning people away. It was me, Mike, and Don Ferrati was still. Like lingering on at that point. We had nobody else. We had no drummer. You know, we were trying to, you know, I was trying to keep it going. And then Don left, and it was a while. And I think even Mike had gotten sick at that point. And, you know, we were still technically a band, but we had a long stretch of a lot of different things where we had a really hard time trying to get people and get it together. At the time when I was being, uh, while I was getting treatments, uh, in fact, the first night I was home from the hospital, I wrote two songs. <clears throat> one of which was called Mr. Barnum, and the other one which was called um, To Thread a Needle. Um, he had a, a tumor, I believe on his back. He also had one when he was younger. And, um, you know, it, it really, you know, it really screwed him up. I honestly, I, I just, I, I was so, in such a depressed state. Uh, it, it was just really hard. Mike had suffered from a very serious form of cancer in his early uh, adolescence. Lost a lot of weight. Um, he was on heavy chemo. And uh, it was just a rough time for him, you know. It was a rough time for me too. I mean, it was like one of my best friends. And, laying there, you know, deteriorating in a hospital bed. 
He had gone through some surgery. Uh, he had uh, experienced radiation and chemotherapy. And uh, very painful episodes that required uh, strong narcotic painkillers too. It surprised me because I was 21 years old and I thought I was gonna die. He was scared, I was scared, we were all scared. His parents were scared, his family, everybody, I mean, you know. You know, he had his, uh, you know, his long hair like he does now, but I guess he went through chemo, so he came in the next day, shaved head and all, and I, I think most people knew what it was about. And... I, I lost weight, I, I, had, I was discolored, uh, my hair was falling out, all the hair on my body fell off. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a devastating feeling, especially for a young kid. Cancer treatment's come a long way, you know, but back then, it's pretty scary. He's a, he's a fighter, man. He's a straw, you know. He's someone who, who takes on what, the, what life has to give him, and he does the best with what he can. He doesn't complain about it. He does the best he can do, and, uh, you know, I, I admire the guy for that. Having been ill, having gotten ill, definitely enhanced my reasoning and my want to be a musician. I became convinced that this, uh, this uh, dreadful experience in his early life had some type of effect that, uh, as I say, alienated Mike. I mean, he was genuine in his, uh, you know, in his adherence to the darkness, to the darker side of uh, humanity. And I, I respected that because it was genuine, and it is genuine. Every day I'd look in the mirror and just not know what was going to happen next. Uh, very emotional time for me at that point in my life. Up in the morning and out to school Mother says there'll be no work next year Qualifications wants a golden rule I'll just pieces of a there's an art in itself to, to maintaining a certain balance between uh, who you are as an individual and who you are as an artist. Well, uh, definition of a sellout is um, compromising values to, to uh, make a profit. It's the root of all evil, it's money. It's, it is, it's pathetic how people are in this business for money. It's not so easy just to get in this business to make money. It's not that simple. If that was the case, shit, we'd all be doing it. You don't need that much money to live in America, you know? If you know how to live wisely, you know? Why is it evil to make money? You know, it's evil to be poor, you know? You know that's, then, then people can push you around and shit, you know? But if you're making, if you're making money, you got clout and you got some esteem. I, I can do, do carpentry, you know? welding, electrical work, and stuff like that. So, so, so that's my, my plan B. I always had a job. I always had a job, you know. I never like to owe or borrow or steal from anybody. I like to provide my own. I've had all sorts of jobs. I was a carpenter for years. I worked in bars. I drove trucks and delivered mattresses and office furniture, and, and I painted and I did everything. If you don't have a trade, um, <clears throat> You're gonna be pretty much fucked because you know ban bands don't don't last forever. We're we're broke. I make no, I make not no money on tour, but I, it's definitely not for the money. I'm sure everybody says this. You have to do it because you absolutely have to do it. Yeah, we just got paid a thousand dollars, but the van cost twelve hundred. So technically, I'm two hundred in the hole. People don't realize that. They think, oh, they made a thousand bucks. There's four of them. That's two fifty each doesn't work like that. There is a business aspect to being an artist as well. I mean, you can sit at home and do your art and not show it to anyone. You're still an artist, but no one's gonna know. You could look at it as, I just busted my ass and I really don't have two nickels to rub together, but at the same time, you just got paid to play guitar and go to Australia. You gotta love it, you can't complain about that, you know? A lot of headlining bands, uh, force their opening bands to to ma match their their merchandise prices and sometimes shirts and hats used to get lost and there was like negative numbers involved you know when you you lost like four shirts most of the heavy metal musicians came from like upper middle class 
okay? They had money. They could, they could buy gigs. And they, they were the ones that became the first victims of, of that, that whole like, pay-to-play scam. And they're the ones that basically empowered the, those promoters. We've, we've had, had bands uh, offer to, to, to uh, pay-to-play. For for typo like well their record company would you know would approach ours and of course our record company be- because that would go towards recouping the album I wouldn't have it promoters don't want to put anything on the line anymore they make local bands sell a million tickets which isn't ever possible and <laughs> trying you know just trying to protect their back and try to make the money for for any guarantee that they have all they would do is just get the name of four or five bands. Put them on a piece of paper, and then they, they would keep like half the money from the door. That alleviates their responsibility of promoting their shows. So, you know, basically, <laughs> get off your ass, stop getting a free ride, and, and do what it is that you said have to you do. Know, at the door, they ask, "Who are you here to see?" And if if I have a hundred people and none of them say the bad hormones, guess what? I don't get paid. The way CBGBs did it, they had the bands playing. The guy was booking the bands, was doing the sound, and he heard the bands, and he saw how the crowd responded to them. And he determined by how the crowd responded to that band, if, where they moved up on the building or if they got another gig. Okay? And it worked fine. Uh, yeah, I, I really don't think they, they have their, their, their hand on the pulse of the situation. They don't, they don't really know what it takes to get, you know, to have a, a successful scene in their area. I really don't think so. Uh, here, I don't think we just rely on them to um you know to bring the crowd you know at least we're doing i think we're doing our part to you know to do it it's time for change time to weed out the old and the weak and the insignificant and plant a new seed i know he had a lot of personal health issues where, um, you know, whether or not he was going to be around in 10 years was in question. And I think that, you know, people, when they face a life or death kind of type of situation, uh, it changes your outlook. I'm not knowing Empire Hideous. I was struck with, all right, here's, here's a band that's certainly operating in the, trad- in the traditions of bands like Fields of the Nephilim, and The Sisters of Mercy, and Mission. Etc. 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 I found it very intriguing. The word emo in its purest form. Those motherfuckers were emo. You know what I mean? Like those, those, some of those goth kids. They were really fluffy back then. Um, but like Empire Hideous and, and and you know, like they were, like like I said, when that shit was getting a little heavier and it was getting ballsier. The whole band was very tight. Like I mean, like they all on cues. They didn't mess up. Very good. Just the the presence that well the band gave and that Mike gave. Awesome front man. Their names were they were around everywhere. They were all over the place. Um, he was like Empire Hades was all over the place. I think I'm dying and glad to have it to see Empire Hades because there's no good gothic bands anywhere. It's, it's a very spiritual thing when I listen to them. But Empire Hades or Stevie's, they were so amazing, so tight. And Mike is a fan of pretty basic rock and roll, but on top of that, he loves all this horror stuff. The so Empire Hades stage performance is always elaborate with a lot of decoration and smoke machines. This is something out of the ordinary. And, you know, they, they become uh, entranced. We had a more of a steady lineup. We had Mars on guitar, Jeff on guitar, and Eve on bass. And at that point, I mean, we stayed together for a number of years and it just exploded. I needed help. I couldn't do it all myself. I had four other people in this band. The term that we use, of course, is a tight band. They were the tightest of tight bands uh, because everybody, they, they, you know, everything was down to the split hundredth of a second and every note was perfect as Mike would have it, as Mike would edit it, as Mike would demand it be. Yeah, it was very militant, but um, sometimes you need that in order to accomplish anything. Uh, if you don't have anyone who takes control of the leads, then nothing gets done. Oh, it's constant drilling, that's for sure. Bring you to the side. This is what you're doing wrong. Fix it. End of story. We finally had a look, a somewhat unified way of thinking. We had a manager. Everything was getting done properly. And that's when it really started to look up. He himself 
put a lot of time into the band, into his image. So he expects the rest. He expects, he expects the same from everyone else. Empire Hideous had a sound that wasn't exactly commercial or I would even say marketable in a sense. It was very underground and alternative. The, the, the difficulty in marketing band like Empire Hideous, it doesn't necessarily aim at a specific audience. It wasn't metal, wasn't punk. Uh, yes, it was somewhat gothic. Yes, it was um, dark. But in a sense, it was just rock and roll on a dark level. Um, I don't think we were ever goth, no. Mm -hmm. I think I've been. I think we tried. I don't think we tried to be anything except, you know, we just tried to express what Mike was trying to do. It doesn't match with those genres at all. Uh,